Continuing our look at hardware, the next two videos are going to take a look at input and output. You might also hear this called I.O. Input is how we get information into the computer. For example, we have keyboards, we have mice, you might see some of the microphone that I'm using. Basically, input is to get information into a computer or into a device. And there's a whole bunch of different input devices you can use. Output is getting information out of the device. So, for example, I'm using a microphone to turn my voice, which is analog, into digital information. It's digitizing it. Those digits, that, that digitization, that zeros and ones, have been put on your computer. You're hearing me and you're seeing me because the computer then takes those ones and zeros and puts it into a format that our brains can understand. So you're seeing visual input. You're seeing visual output from the computer and you're hearing audio output from your computer. So input. Take a quick look at your computer, at your mobile device, and just think about how many different ways you can put information into that computer. If you're sitting where I'm sitting right now, I see, let's see, I see a keyboard, I see a mouse, I see a microphone, I see a webcam. These are different input devices that I have at my disposal. Some examples of common input devices are things like the keyboard. This would be the most common input device that we have. The mouse, touch screens, graphics pads, trackballs, joysticks, barcode readers, light pens, assistive technology. This is for people with different physical impairments that they can use the computer. Look no further than Dr. Stephen Hawking's. If you've ever seen him, I'm sure you've seen him if you've ever, if you've been around for a while, you've seen Dr. Stephen Hawking's. He uses assistive technology in order to be able to communicate and access the computer. Keyboard is probably the most common, not the most probably, it is the most common input device currently, and it even predates the mouse. So before there was a mouse, there was the keyboard. Most keyboards are known as what we call QWERTY keyboards. If you take a look at the keyboard you're at right now, you can see why. Look at the keys, Q-W-E-R-T-Y, the QWERTY keyboard. This is the most common type of keyboard that's out there. Now there are other variations of the keyboard that will put the letters in different orders, but QWERTY is the king as far as the keyboards go. You can always adjust your keyboard settings if you want to adjust how fast it takes before it repeats a letter or sticky keys. This would be an example of using assistive technology. You can access these options in your Mac as well as your Windows computer. What's kind of interesting and also kind of gross about the keyboard is that it is a tremendous magnet for junk. It's a tremendous magnet for just icky stuff. In fact, if you look at some studies, your keyboard is actually dirtier than the average toilet seat. Yeah. So we're going to talk about cleaning your keyboard really quick. And this is not part of an intro class or a BCIS class, but it's definitely something you as a consumer should know how to do. Cleaning it's pretty simple. Now the first rule of doing any work on a computer, any hardware work, is typically unplugging, turning off and unplugging the computer. You don't really want an electrical current going through your computer. Most, by the way, most modern computers have an electrical current running through them even when they're turned off. So not only do you want to turn off a computer, you also want to unplug it. Or if you have it through a surge suppressor, which you should have something, you should have it through a surge suppressor to keep it from getting zapped. You want to shut that off. So make sure the computer is either unplugged or turned off at your surge suppressor. What you're going to want to do is just do an initial clean. Clean the top of your keyboard with a damp cloth. You can also use pre-made computer cleaners. You can get them at any big box store, grocery store. They typically have special wipes designed for electronics and keyboards. You can also get some compressed air. Now, when you're dealing with the compressed air, you're going to want to hold it, the can upright. You don't want to hang it upside down. That'd be bad. But on most keyboards, now mine doesn't really have it, but most keyboards you can get underneath the keys pretty easily and you want to blow it out. And as you're the air, you want to kind of hold it at an angle so the crap can get out. Now, word of caution, if you haven't cleaned your keyboard out or your computer out in a while, you probably don't want to do it inside the house because a lot of crap's going to come out of it. So you want to do it outside or somewhere where there's great ventilation so you're not inhaling that dust. So, for example, if I wanted to clean my keyboard, I would get a damp cloth, not wet, not sopping wet, but damp. 
and just wipe off the keyboard. And again, with a canned air, you can shh in between the keys. When I was first starting off in the computer world, I had to try to get some experience. And nobody's going to hire you without experience. And you can't get experience without a job. It's a nice little catch-22. And so what I would do is I would volunteer at one of the local schools. And I would go in and I would clean their computers. And it was an elementary school. Not only did I have to clean the keyboard with a damp wet cloth uh, and a can of compressed air, I also had to use tweezers in order to get underneath the keys to take out some of the crap that the kids would... um put in there. It was just all sorts of fun. So that's how you would clean your keyboard. The mouse. What's kind of cool is the very first personal computer, the very first PCs out there didn't have mice attached to it. In fact, I still remember my first computer. I had a 386 and I would have to, if I wanted a mouse, I had to install a serial mouse. I had to actually open up my case for my computer and install an expansion card to allow me to use a mouse. Um, nowadays we have Bluetooth mice, we have USB, all this good stuff. You have tons of options for mice. You can get all sorts of different mice. For example, my Apple came with a really cool little touchpad mouse. Um, not really good for doing graphics that I found my personal preference. So I wound up getting a Logitech mouse. This is actually kind of a gaming mouse. What's really cool is it has a weight system in here. So I find for example for myself having this much control with a mouse is very useful you can spend anywhere from a couple of bucks on a mouse to a couple hundred depending on the kind of mouse you want to get so it really becomes a preference there you can clean your mouse as well in fact you probably still want to clean your mouse if you have one of the older mice then it still has that little trackball inside so it's a little ball inside to clean that you just twist off the bottom Take the ball out, wash it with some hand soap, things like that. Make sure it's completely dry and then put it back in the mouse. That usually takes care of any really dirty mice. You can scrape the connections inside, but I wouldn't recommend it. Uh, if you don't really know what you're doing, you can kind of do more damage than not. I would say nowadays those old uh, ball mice are pretty much gone. You're more likely to encounter an optical mouse. And this is what I have right here is an optical mouse. So you don't see any ball on the bottom, but we do have is a tracker down here and it can be um, uh, different technologies that will track. One of the things that you can do to clean this again is just a damp cloth, wipe off the mouse. And if you have pets, for example, you might've heard a meow uh, earlier in this video, I've got a cat and I've got a dog. If you notice that your mouse, your cursor is kind of jumping on your screen, that's a good indication you have a hair, an animal hair, stuck right in here where you're tracking your information. A canned compressed air, we'll clean it out. Again, damp cloth, and that should take care of that problem. How often should you clean these things? Well, it really depends on your household or where you work and how nasty they can get. Moving on. The next thing is a scanner. The scanner is basically a photocopier for your computer. It's going to take what we call hard copy. Hard copy being paper, being documents, being something tangible, okay, something that you can touch and feel. And it's going to turn it into something called soft copy. Soft copy is the digital version of that. So, for example, if you have a book, if you buy a book, the book is hard copy. If you buy the book on the Kindle or the Nook, then it is something called soft copy. You don't actually have physically the book. You're looking at the text of the book through a computer or through a computer screen or an e-reader or something along those lines. Things to consider when buying a scanner is you're going to, first of all, think about your budget. How much money do you have to spend? These things, again, can run anywhere from, let's say, about $50 and go up from there. What do you need it for? Are you using this to scan photographs? Are you using it just to keep copies of some documents? What is your need? Resolution, this is dots per inch DPI. Basically, dots per inch, the more dots per inch you have, the clearer the image becomes. The more dots per inch, the more um, fine, finer the image becomes. The more fine details that you can pick up in the image. Uh, that you scan occur. So you're looking for resolution for one. You're also looking for bit depth. This is about how well it represents the colors of whatever you're trying to scan. Obviously, something like resolution and bit depth 
are important if you're trying to scan images and try to keep them true to the original version. If you just need a scanner to scan, let's say, hospital bills or documentation, you know, buy the cheap one, you're good to go. You really don't need fine details for that. You're basically putting a fax machine on your computer. Now, I will say, uh, you know, I've got a printer, which is an all-in-one. It comes with a scanner and a printer all-in-one. And that's more or less what you're going to find a lot of these scanners have become. It's an all-in-one, part of the printer, part scanner, all that good stuff. Okay, our next video, we're going to take a look at output. 